Kristen Bluefin was furious. Who was this woman sleeping in her bed? She would have to take care of this because she knew Haddon was too much of a wimp. Welcome to Serial Killer Brains. I'm your host, Caroline, a university biology professor and true crime junkie. Thanks for joining me on my quest to understand evil. This is the story of cannibal brothers Bradfield and Haddon Clark. Penny Hotling had suffered much loss. Her younger brother died in a car accident when he was just two years old. When she was a child, her father lost his job and his land, and he died shortly after that. Penny was sent to Richmond, Virginia to live with an unmarried aunt while her mother and sister moved in with other relatives. This didn't stop Penny from being a successful human being, though. She went to Smith College and graduated with a master's degree in social work in 1952. She got married that same year, but then in 1954, he tragically committed suicide. Then, Penny's mother committed suicide in 1960. So, so far, she's lost a younger brother, her father, um, her first husband, and her mother. I, I can't even imagine. She remarried in 1964 and had two children with her second husband. And these children were Warren and Laura. This husband suffered de- from depression as well, and he would disappear for days at a time. And eventually the couple were divorced in 1977. He died of cancer when Penny's daughter, Laura, was 17. This was in about 1986. Penny's daughter, Laura, grew into a beautiful young woman who reached six feet tall. She had long blonde hair and an athletic build. She had been accepted to Harvard University right out of high school where she majored in history. She was a self-proclaimed feminist and she graduated with honors. She was loved by her friends and her professors. Even the most uptight of them were drawn to her. She was considering law school when she moved back to her mother's house in Bethesda, Maryland in 1992, several months before Laura moved back home. Um, Penny had had a friend named Sue Snyder who She worked with a group of homeless men, one of whom was Haddon Clark. Penny needed some help in her garden, and so Sue recommended that Haddon come to help her. Penny thought that hiring Haddon would be this great philanthropic gesture. She allowed Haddon to come in and out of the house to get coffee or water or even to use the bathroom. She would turn a blind eye when things started to disappear. Strands of pearls, underwear, clothing garden tools would disappear and then reappear. When she asked him about the tools, Haddon lost his temper and Penny thought she might have been too hard on him. Sometimes she would see him coming out of Laura's room, but Penny said nothing. Penny had a split level home in Bethesda and she had a therapy practice in her basement. Her daughter, Laura, had been in Philadelphia um, and was coming back to stay with her. She decided what she was gonna do next. To bide her time in 1992, Laura worked as an administrative assistant for a female-led communications company. Laura was destined to be successful, and she had her whole life ahead of her. On October 12th, Penny told Haddon that she was going out of town for the week from October 17th through the 25th. On October 14th, Haddon went to a hardware store, and he purchased the following items. He purchased two rolls of duct tape, a coil of braided rope, three boxes of nylon cord, and he wrote a check for $21.13. In the memo line, he wrote Laura's name. Haddon did not like that Laura was coming back home. He felt that Laura was going to take his place in Penny's heart. October 17th, Laura met up with friends, and she didn't return home till about 2 o'clock in the morning. Laura had left her car um, where she had been the day before. So on October 18th, she had her brother Warren take her to where she'd left her car, And then she did normal Sunday afternoon things. She watched football, chatted on the phone, those sorts of things. She went to bed that night at 11 p.m. in a t-shirt and panties. Just about midnight, Haddon pulled up on the street in front of Penny's. He went to the garden shed to retrieve the extra house key that he knew Penny kept there. Haddon was wearing a woman's Paula Young wig, um, it was long blonde hair, Penny's underwear, and he was carrying a black purse and he wore women's flats. He also wore a lady's blouse and tan slacks and a woman's trench coat with a 22 caliber rifle tucked underneath. Haddon entered the house and he made his way to Laura's room where she slept. His plan was to kidnap her and take her to his campsite and introduce her to Haddon. So at this point, Haddon was in full on Kristen Bluefin persona, his alter personality. You see, Haddon had multiple personalities. One was Kristen Bluefin. 
and Kristen Bluefin was the one that was typically in charge. Then there was Nicole, Kristen's evil daughter, who was the one who killed Michelle, who killed Michelle Dorr. Haddon was too much of a wimp to do the killing himself, so he left it to his female alter egos to do his dirty work for him. Kristen Bluefin poked Laura with the rifle to wake her up, and he asked her why she was in, in Kristen's bed, and then asked why she was wearing Kristen's clothing, and then he instructed her to call him Laura. Laura replied, you are Laura, please don't hurt me. Haddon then made her swear on the Bible that Haddon was Laura. Kristen made Laura get up, undress, bathe, and like I said, he had planned to abduct Laura and take her back to the campsite so he could introduce her to Haddon. Kristen had Laura lie face down on the bed. He bound her wrists and ankles with duct tape, then turned her back over and duct taped her mouth. But Kristen was so wound up that that Kristen kept wrapping the tape around her head, around Laura's head, covering her mouth, nose, and eyes. And eventually Laura suffocated. Haddon, Kristen actually, tried to cut the tape off of her once Laura stopped moving, but claims to have missed and stabbed her in the neck, which caused blood to spill on her sheets and onto the mattress pad. Kristen wanted Laura's earrings, but could not get one of them off. So instead of working it out of the earring hole, uh, Kristen cut off Laura's earlobe. Kristen Haddon then sat with her for nearly an hour, stroking her body and her breast, but swore he did not rape her or practice cannibalism. Then at three o'clock in the morning, Kristen Haddon wrapped her body up in a sheet and carried her to his pickup truck. He got rid of all the bloody evidence from inside, took Laura's clasp ring, a crystal unicorn, her camera, and some other jewelry in her briefcase. Then Kristen lay down on her bed, and for a few hours, Kristen was Laura. Haddon rested. At about 8 o'clock in the morning, Kristen Haddon left the house wearing that same blonde wig, the trench coat, slacks, women's flats, and white socks, carrying a black purse. A neighbor's housekeeper was standing on the corner with a little boy waiting for the bus stop when she saw who she thought was Laura leaving from work. When Laura didn't show up for work, Laura's boss, Diana Holman, began to worry. So she called her daughter, who was a friend of Laura's, to see if she had spoken to Laura. Hillary decided to go by the Hotling's house to see if Laura was homesick and just not answering the phone. When Hillary arrived, she said Laura's car was parked out front, so she tried to the sliding glass doors at the back of the house, and they were open. So Hillary went to Laura's room, and nothing looked out of place, but the bed was not made the way Laura usually made it. Hillary called Laura's brother Warren and left a message for him. As soon as Warren got off work and got that message, he started calling friends, but no one had heard from Laura. So he and his roommate decided to drive to uh, to the Hotling's house to check things out and noticed that a light in the kitchen that was always on was turned off. Warren and his roommate started to walk the route to the metro station. And after about a mile, they saw Haddon driving towards the house. And Warren tried to wave him down, but Haddon made a quick U-turn and took off because Laura was still in the back of his truck. Warren gave Haddon the benefit of the doubt because he knew Haddon was weird. At midnight, Warren called the Bethesda police, who did the same thing Warren had done, but they reassured Warren that 90% of the time, people who they think are missing show back up. Warren called Penny the next morning, and she flew right home. Haddon, on the other hand, was spooked after seeing Warren, so he knew he needed to bury Laura's body some, like somewhere quick. So Haddon, being the disorganized, not super intelligent man that he was, buried Laura across the highway from his campsite. And by that spring, parts of Laura's body would start to surface, would start to surface. Haddon went on the run and he headed towards Rhode Island. He was anxious to get to his storage unit in Warwick. Apparently he had a couple storage units. On October 21st, 1992, Haddon deposited the trinkets he had stolen from Laura in the storage unit, but he kept Laura's pillowcase so he could relive the murder whenever he wanted, and he knew he could go back to the storage unit whenever he wanted to get a bigger thrill with the bloody sheet. Delightful. Montgomery County Bethesda Police detectives wanted to talk to Haddon after Warren and Penny had mentioned his name. When the detective who was investigating Laura's disappearance called in Haddon's name, Another officer asked if Haddon wasn't the one who was a, a suspect in the Michelle Dorr disappearance. 
Penny, however, did not think that Haddon had anything to do with Laura's disappearance. In fact, Haddon even mailed a sympathy card that said, quote, just please give me a call when you are ready to do some gardening again. I can bring you some bagels on Friday, too, end quote. Detectives called Haddon and asked him to come in. Haddon took Laura's bloody pillowcase and threw it by a tree in the woods. Let's take a quick break to hear a word from the show's sponsors. On October 22nd, 1992, Haddon showed up at the police station with Sue Snyder of the homeless group Bethesda Cares. When asked about his movements, Haddon said this is what he did on October 18th and 19th. He watched the World Series at the malt shop above the Dancing Crab on Sunday night, but he only had coffee. He bedded down at the North Bethesda United Methodist Church in the parking lot. Um, He slept in his, sometimes he would sleep in his truck in the parking lot. And he slept until about nine o'clock the next morning. He got up and went grocery shopping, which I have a hard time believing since he ate rotten, disgusting things that he would find and let them rot. It was really disgusting. He tried to do some gardening for a family, but they weren't home. So he went to a skate shop and then he went to Bethesda Cares twice. He says he helped out a homeless man named John. He did his laundry, took a shower, and on the way back to church to sleep for the night, he said he ran into Warren, who he thought was a carjacker, so he went to a different church to sleep and worked on his Christmas cards. Aw, isn't that nice, Haddon, working on his Christmas cards? When Haddon and Sue left the police station, Haddon started to sob, and when Sue asked him what was the matter, he told Sue he just felt so bad for Warren and Penny. I'm sure he did. On October 21st, 1992, the police came to Penny's house to search the house, and they brought a canine unit with them. The dog sniffed around Laura's room, around the rest of the house, um, got a scent, and then they went to the woods behind the North Bethesda United Methodist Church with the canine. And the canine unit quickly found Laura's pillowcase that Haddon had thrown over by a tree. They also found a bunch of women's clothes, including a bra, a blouse, women's shoes, Um, and lots of lingerie, all which belonged to Penny. The pillowcase was placed there more recently than the lingerie, though. Back at the house, they used luminol in Penny's room, and half of the mattress lit up. So luminol is a chemical that when it interacts with blood, and you then put a light on it, like a UV light on it, it'll light up if there had been blood present. So even if you can't see blood from with the naked eye, you it'll luminol can still show you that there had been blood there they also found a hair from a wig and a man's hair from the head in penny's room as well so the detectives went looking for haddon and they found him a few hours later there was a tv crew following the detectives so when haddon got pulled over there was a tv crew there one of the detectives told haddon that they needed his help finding laura and when haddon saw the cameras he dramatically dropped to his knees and began crying he said i'm so scared oh god i just want to die he went on to tell the camera crew that the days of the rockville rocket were numbered and that because of all the publicity, he would never work again. He went on to say that he was just a homeless man, and that he had no friends, and he would be jobless after this. Poor, poor Haddon. The police brought him in to question him, and asked him if he thought Laura was pretty. Haddon told them he hadn't paid much attention to her. Detectives told him that his fingerprint was on a bloody pillowcase that they found in the woods. At this point, Haddon started to cry, and he pulled his hat down over his eyes. Detectives asked him um, what he did with Laura, and Haddon told him that he didn't remember. The only thing he confided to the cops is that he dressed in women's clothing. The cops had a search warrant the next day and took Haddon's truck. In his truck, they found a mileage log, bed sheets, a checkbook log, checkbook stubs, and statements showed the incriminating check to the hardware store and showed that he had rented several storage units and P.O. boxes. So remember that check that Haddon had written for $21.13 that in the memo line he wrote Laura. A couple of items would perplex the detectives. A hand-drawn map, an eyeglass case filled with dirt that was not native to D.C. It looked like it came from somewhere near the ocean, and this will be important later. 
Haddon had been in one of his storage units twice on the day that Laura disappeared, so they wanted to get into his storage unit. After seeing Haddon on TV, several people from one of his former jobs, um, a place called What's a Bagel, they called him with tips of where Haddon's campsite was and that they... They also revealed to the police that Haddon had remarked that he wanted to do Laura, to have sex with Laura. By this point, Penny realized that whoever had killed Laura or taken Laura or whatever must have had a key to the house to be able to get in the way they did. On October 30th and 31st, 1992, Haddon went on the run. He headed to Rhode Island and to his storage unit in Warwick. The gal that worked at the storage unit there asked Haddon what he was doing, and Haddon told her that he was getting his father's ashes, which was a lie because he had actually taken his father's ashes and spread them two years earlier. In his storage unit, he got together all of Laura's items, and he drove to Wellfleet, stopping halfway to dump some of the incriminating evidence. Once he made it to Wellfleet, that's where his um, family home had been, he made it to Wellfleet by the afternoon, and he went to the Pleasant Hill Cemetery. He was in such a frenzy to get Laura's stuff hidden that he backed into the cemetery um, and knocked over a gravestone, but he couldn't dig up what he wanted because there was a woman nearby praying at a grave. Haddon left the graveyard and drove to his sister's place in Rhode Island. Haddon made it to his sister's place, and when he got there, he told her that the police were trying to pin a crime on him because he was homeless. He didn't stay long telling Allison that he needed to keep moving. He went back to the cemetery in Wellfleet, and by this time, it was Halloween night. He didn't think anyone would be in the graveyard, so he dug between his father's and grandfather's graves looking for his buckets of treasure. These buckets of treasure would contain more than 200 pieces of jewelry, watches, and trinkets from his victims over 15 years. According to Haddon, much of it was from women he supposedly murdered, and this this came out much later. Under his bucket, he had the remains of a little girl supposedly named Sarah, who he had killed and partially eaten back in 1985. Um, but this is all this, all this information came out much later in a way that we will discuss in the final episode next time. Haddon took his bucket of treasures and buried at the back of the property that Silas and Edith had lived. On November 1st, 1992, there was a memorial service for Laura. Around this time, evidence came back matching the bloody fingerprint on Laura's pillowcase with Hatton. So even though the police had told him that it matched his fingerprint, they were still, they still, you know, because the police can lie to you. um, They had to wait for that to come back, for the evidence to come back. So the night that this information came in, the police went to arrest Haddon, and they found him at 1017 in the parking lot at the First Baptist Church in Bethesda. So for whatever reason, he was on the run from the police, but he went right back to Bethesda um, after, after getting his bucket of trinkets and moving them. They found Haddon in his truck under a quilt, snuggling with a one eyed teddy bear. So cute. When they told Haddon he was under arrest for the murder of Laura, Haddon just shrugged. The police got Haddon back to the station, and they started to interrogate him, but none of the cops had read Haddon his Miranda rights. The Montgomery police were embarrassed and pissed off that they had let Haddon get away before, so even though Haddon asked for his lawyer more than 100 times, they ignored him. They were convinced that Haddon killed Laura and Michelle Dorr. They set up the interrogation room to look like a living room, and they picked three attractive female detectives to interrogate him. They tried many different tactics in order to get him to admit to what he had done. They tried to be seductive, motherly, crude, but nothing worked. They asked him if she, if he was into necrophilia, animals, incest, but hadn't just kept asking for his lawyer. This went on for hours. The female detectives had underestimated Haddon's intelligence. At 2.52 a.m., Sergeant Garvey, who was the investigator on the Michelle Dorr disappearance, he went in to talk with Haddon some more. Um, Garvey started to intentionally mispronounce Haddon's name. He started calling him Hayden. He asked Haddon if Haddon recognized him, and Haddon said he didn't think so. Garvey then pretended like he just remembered having interviewed Haddon about Michelle. He brought out Michelle's missing poster, and Haddon threw it on the floor. He brought out a bathing suit like the one Michelle had been wearing that day and told Haddon that he knew he had felt the bathing suit before when he put Michelle on his shoulder. This made Haddon shudder. So Garvey was when Garvey left the room, they heard Haddon saying, oh boy, you want to go swimming? They got you a bathing suit, you know that? I'm going to take you swimming. Finally, Haddon started to speak in a feminine voice and told them he buried 
Michelle under his childhood treehouse. He was lying, of course. Haddon was booked at 6.10 in the morning. Let's take one more quick break to hear from some sponsors. Haddon was not able to keep his current lawyer, Donald Sulzman, because he was a public attorney who represented the indigent, and Haddon had $40,000. So he retained lawyers from the firm of John C. Monahan. The, lawyers, the lawyer, Benjamin S. Vaughn, um, normally defended hospitals from malpractice, so he may not have been really equipped to defend Haddon. Haddon was being held without bond at Montgomery County Detention Center. He saw a female medic while he was there and immediately told her that he was not signing autographs that day, but she didn't know who he was. He told her that, um, you know, they're not going to find a thing. The medic nurse took notes and wrote about Haddon, and she, she had no idea who he was, but she wrote, quote, he makes one feel uncomfortable, but it's difficult to assess why. Haddon, while in jail, would sob, I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have killed her. By late November, Montgomery County cops had gone to Haddon's storage unit in Rhode Island. In the storage unit was a painting that his grandmother Edith had given Jeff, but Haddon had stolen from Jeff in 1987 and faked a signature from his grandmother on the back. <laughs> Jesus. He was indicted for first-degree murder on December 17, 1992, and his trial was scheduled for June of 1993. In January of 93, the police went to the Wellfleet Cemetery. They found the knocked over headstones and overturned dirt. Um, cadaver dogs hit on the spot. You might be thinking, well, it's a graveyard. Duh, of course, a cadaver dog is going to hit on all sorts of places all over the cemetery. But cadaver dogs do not respond to uh, bodies that have been embalmed. So obviously there had been some sort of decomposing human remains that had been buried next to the grave site. The police thought that what had happened was Haddon realized the police had his hand-drawn map of Wellfleet, so he drove there to move the body, um, and they assumed it was the body of Laura, but this was wrong. They were also wrong when they later assumed that the body had been of Michelle Dore. By the spring of 1993, the police still had, did not have Laura's body, but they were able to get Haddon to plead to second-degree murder under the condition that Haddon be allowed to serve a sentence at the... Pato Zent, I don't know how to say it, P-A-T-U-X-E-N-T -E institution, which is a prison with a psychiatric hospital. So when it was time, Haddon stood up in court and said, quote, during the early morning hours of October 19th, 1992, I entered the home of Laura and Penny Hotling. I found Laura alone in her bedroom. I killed her by means of suffocation while she lay there in bed. I moved her from her home and buried her. I was not assisted by any other person and suffered no delusions at the time of the crime. I committed the crime of my own free will. I profoundly regret my actions, and I wish to extend my deepest sorrows and regrets to the family of Laura Holtling with all my heart. I am pleading guilty because I am guilty and for no other reason, end quote. He immediately told his lawyers where they could find Laura, which was right near his campsite. Haddon was sentenced on June 25th, 1993. During, sentences, during sentencing, it came out that Haddon had a malfunction in the left lobe of his brain. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But he was not sent to the psychiatric prison. He was given a maximum sentence of 30 years. And he was sent to the Eastern Correctional Institution. He would spit in the drinks of other convicts, or he would pour salt into their coffee instead of sugar, and he was often put into protective custody because of this. In August of 1994, Haddon was sent to the, the Pato Zent Institution to undergo a six-month evaluation. He was rejected from entering into any long-term psychiatric programs for some reason. Haddon began to tell anyone who would listen about how he killed Michelle, and he gave so many details that several of the other prisoners were totally disgusted by him. And a couple of them recorded his confession. As a result of Haddon's confessions in September of 1995, police went to Jeff's house on Sudbury, um, on Sudbury Lane, and they pulled up the floorboards and carpet of Eliza's room and sent it off for mitochondrial DNA analysis. The reason that they did mitochondrial DNA analysis instead of nuclear DNA is because there are so many more copies of mitochondrial DNA than there are of nuclear DNA. So every cell has one nucleus, 
but it has many, many, many mitochondria. So even if nuclear DNA is totally degraded, there may still be some mitochondrial DNA left. And mitochondrial DNA, the mitochondrial DNA is inherited from your mother, whereas nuclear DNA is inherited from both mother and father. And then back in 1995, DNA analysis was in its infancy. 1995 was the same year of O.J. Simpson's trial for the murder of Ronald Gold Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. So that sort of tells you where DNA was back at that time. So mitochondrial DNA was their best bet. And it turned out that the blood was likely from Michelle, but this was not definitive. And the use of DNA in criminal trials was not as widely accepted as it is today. Now, if you go, if you're on a jury and it's for anything, really, people expect to have DNA evidence. And back in 1995, the average person had no idea what DNA was other than maybe what they learned in high school biology or college biology that, you know, DNA carries your, your body's blueprint. But, but most people didn't know exactly what DNA was and what it meant. So around this time, Detective Tarney, who is one of the officers investigating the Michelle Dorr case, brought Haddon in to interrogate him, um, to interrogate him again, but this time he had a warrant. To which Haddon said, quote, oh, well, I'm the Rockville Rocket, the Rockville Rocket, that's me. This could be a bunch of bullshit to try to break me, end quote. Haddon's mother, Flavia, died on September 17th, 1995 from breast cancer. So I mentioned earlier that um, when Haddon was uh, checked out, it appeared that he had damage to his left temporal lobe. Located within the temporal lobe is the temporal pole, which is often um, seen to have lower activity in people who have undergone childhood trauma or maltreatment. A reduction in volume is often found in aggressive and personality disordered individuals. Offenders who were victims of child abuse, psychopaths, and antisocial and violent individuals show, reduc show reduction in the right temporal cortex. The temporal lobe is also responsible for helping to process auditory stimuli. So whatever you hear at the temporal lobe is part of the circuit which processes that auditory input. Now, in somebody who is schizophrenic, Often there are auditory hallucinations, but these can be conceptualized as internally generated speech misrepresentations, and they are compartmentalized into part of the superior temporal lobe. So this could account for um, some of Haddon's sort of detachment from reality, or it might have been that he was hearing voices, and the voice was of Kristen Bluefin or Nicole, the Kristen Bluefin's daughter. And these could have been auditory hallucinations that were telling him to, to kill. And I'm just speculating here. I don't know for sure. But damage to the temporal lobe can result in such things. Regardless, it's pretty clear that Haddon was a very, um, or still is, and he's still alive, is a very sick individual with a lot of mental illness that probably began early in childhood and has followed him through his adult life. Next time, we're going to talk about the relationship um, of Haddon to a man he called Jesus. I'll also spend um, a good portion of time breaking down Haddon Clark's various psychopathies and mental illnesses and kind of explaining where they came from and what they may have caused. This has been Serial Killer Brains with your host, Caroline, university biology professor, true crime junkie. Thanks for joining me on my quest to understand evil. Until next time. If you're enjoying the show, please take a minute to rate and review it on your podcatcher of choice. You can follow me on most of your social media platforms at SKB Pod, or you can visit my website for music credits and other references and a little blog at www.skbpod.com.